September 21st, 1987. It's been one year since I first went inside that house. I have to finish what I started. What I am about to do has not been approved by the Vatican. Faith the Unholy Trinity. A game about the satanic panic, finding your faith, facing the past, and obviously, cults. There's a lot of demons as well in this series that is in-game lore specific, but also many we know from real-life grimoires and cultures. This video will be focusing on the Ars Goetia aspect and delving more into these demons found throughout the series, and some related imagery. This is the first of a two-part video series, this one focusing on the Ars Goetia aspect and delving more into other demons found throughout the series in the second video. Footage scene will involve some speedrun tech because that's what I do. With that being said, let's get started. One of the first demons we're introduced to is Lucifer, mentioned in a note in Chapter 2 stating, Not all those who say Lucifer, Lucifer will inherit his kingdom. Lucifer as a whole is a complicated topic. It was never meant to be a title, and is even a minor Roman deity that is the planet of Venus, also known as Phosphorus. And naturally, in the Bible it is written in Isaiah 14.12, How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn, likely in reference to the fall of Babylon. Through demonization of the spirit, Lucifer became mentioned in the Dictionary Infernal by Colin de Plancy, published in 1863, where he is described as Lucifer, name of the spirit who presides over the East, according to the opinion of magicians. Lucifer was evoked on Monday, in a circle in the middle of which was his name. He was content with a mouse as the reward for his complacence, he is often taken for the King of Hell, and, according to some demonums, he is superior to Satan. It is said that he is sometimes facetious and that one of his tricks is to remove the brooms on which witches go to the Sabbath and to give them some on their shoulders, which the witches of Moira in Sweden attested in 1672. The same witches affirmed that they had seen at the Sabbath the same Lucifer in a grey habit, with blue stockings and red breeches adorned with ribbons. Lucifer commands Europeans and Asiatics, he appears in the form and figure of the most beautiful child, when he is angry, his face is inflamed, but there is nothing monstrous about it. According to some demonographers, he is the great avenger of hell. He is the first to be invoked in the litanies of the Sabbath. In The Sacred Magic of Abermel and the Mage by Samuel McGregor Mathers, it states, Lucifer, from Latin, lux, light, and ferro, to bear, a light bearer. There is a name, Lucifuge, also employed occasionally from lux, light, and fugio, to fly from, he who shuns the light. For more insight, I thought I'd contact practicing Luciferian, demon altar, and author Myrtle Wake for her viewpoint. After asking about the demons mentioned in the Ars Goetia, three particular questions made things quite evident that it needed a voice chat rather than text interview. So consider this a little interview with a theistic Luciferian. In order to have a balanced playing field, I also wanted a Christian's input on the topic, so that will likely be involved in the second video. If you're not interested in this type of format, the video will contain information on Faith's demons afterward. Uh, okay. Mert, it's a pleasure, a pleasure to have you on this very, very quick call uh, for the questions that I was uh, very, very curious on your opinion. Um, there is a note described in Faith Chapter 2 uh, where it states, Lu if you say uh, inheriting the kingdom of Lucifer, it's like if you say Lucifer, Lucifer, not all people who say Lucifer, Lucifer inherit the kingdom. And I'm wondering what your opinion is on Lucifer's kingdom as a Luciferian, or if there is any. I love how you phrased that question. I got confused at about the point where you said <laughs> not everyone that says Lucifer, Lucifer inherits the. Lu there was a lot of words in the road that just kind of, yeah. Um, I understood the question, but <laughs> it could be phrased better unless the note itself is phrased like Bloody Mary, Bloody Mary. So <laughs> it legit is just saying like not all those who stayed Lucifer, Lucifer will inherit the, his kingdom. Oh, Jesus, that is, mm, that it's is, yeah, much, very yeah. Bloody Mary, Bloody Mary sort of line. Yeah, um, it's very spooky. I... 
It's so hard to explain how I see spirituality on the call fast. Let, let's see. Um, I wouldn't attribute anything overly physical to spirits, and I find it better to just view spirits as a sea. So, in my opinion, there is a glob of energy that's Lucifer, and you can most definitely be on the inside of that energy, but if... I don't know if we're calling it a kingdom, or... And then, I mean, if you're splitting something that doesn't have physical boundaries to begin with, you could be like, that's a kingdom, and that's a kingdom, and like, one molecule of it is a kingdom, and like, the whole thing is a kingdom, so... Um... I say not putting too much physical emphasis on things in spirituality is probably the best approach to take if, you know, you're taking a spiritual approach to being spiritual. So, in a way, there is a kingdom, but honestly, because it's all in... God damn it. Okay, how to phrase it to people that might not understand any of this shit? Um... It's all in your mind, but your mind is a lot bigger than you think that it is, so... Is dream world a world? Um, is astral a thing? Um, in a way, a kingdom can be a kingdom, but at the same time it's not really there because it isn't physical. It's not a place, but also it can be a place and a person at the same time, so yeah, did anyone get any of that? <laughs> <laughs> it's a um it, it's not material in essence yes if, if you're just if you take a lot of wibbly wobbly timey wimey stuff and just like put it in a ball and you call that something and if that something was you and anything that you saw inside your mind was you know technically there then do you actually have a kingdom, or are you a ball of wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey stuff? <laughs> <laughs> Answer that question, and you probably answered the question of Does Spirit X have a kingdom or not? Yeah, I think the way that you phrase it is, uh, it's much more understandable than perhaps some people might phrase it. Definitely I wouldn't be able to phrase it correctly. Uh, I am very <laughs> long-winded. So, yeah, thank you for putting it in a more concise uh, response. So, yeah, okay, so that, that will be the Kingdom of Luc uh, Lucifer from the Luciferian's perspective. I, I I absolutely love that somebody's gonna watch the video and gonna be like, what the fuck is that crazy lady talking about? <laughs> I'm sure some people will definitely understand it, though. Um... <laughs> I was also just wondering, how do you view Lucifer as a spirit? It's a very open question, so uh, feel free to take it how you, however you wish. I think the most apt way of viewing Lucifer is uh, as a representation of Venus, and specifically Venus in the morning, more than anything else, because a lot of associations that people have had with Venus in the morning keep on cropping back up in my personal practice. Like, Eye of Horus, or Lucifer seemingly being interconnected with the idea of hope and healing, which is definitely not something that comes from his personal mythos. So over time, I th think the best description is literally everything that you associate with Venus in the morning is Lucifer. Yeah, that's a very beautiful way of putting it. <laughs> like phosphorus I mean, and Venus, yeah. Yeah, that, that's the one connective point that I found in his mythos that seems to stay consistent in my personal practice and that seems to, you know, come out with any other person that practices with this figure in particular. Yeah. And if you take him only to, like, represent knowledge and self-knowing of yourself, it doesn't quite fit, so literally just... That one association with the planet, I, I don't know how that came to be, but that, that seems to be very much what the Spirit's giving in all of his representations, no matter what name you attach to said energy. 
Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And then obviously you can't write down basically everything that is attributed to a spirit because there would be just so much. <laughs> <laughs> but um, my, my next question would be, why do you think Lucifer keeps getting mixed up with Satan? Uh, isn't that just that one biblical verse of, um, Oh, son of morning, how have you fallen? Which was attributed to the Babylonian king, but was also mm -hmm. taken to be the name of the fallen angel, and then the fallen angel. And because, well, the bright morning star in the sky was always Venus, which was kind of known as, you know, Lucifer. Um, it's literal translation of that name. Somebody at one point just forgot to translate a part of the book. And then people were like, well, that descriptor that was used for Babylonian king, it also alludes to a set of events where angels fell and the leading angel's main name, Satan's, must have been Lucifer. But the whole Satan thing is really confused to begin with because it's not really a name, it's a title. There are a lot of Satans in the Bible, uh, ranging from just some guy that offered food to Jesus um, to like the Satan of Satan Samuel, which is very much on, you know, the God's side. So when people go Satan, you kind of need to be like, okay, which of the Satans do you precisely mean? And then they get very confused, going, what? And then they go, what, back? Then if you think Satan as adversarial energy, and it's just overall descriptor, technically, all pagan faiths will fall under Satan because every single god you could see as being somewhat adversarial to the Christian way of, you know, living because the Christian way of living also includes just converting all religions under one single god, so anything that doesn't go by that definition kind of also can fall under the adversary, so technically it's not entirely wrong to conflate Lucifer with Satan in a very roundabout way, but it doesn't really have a place in the Bible. But at the same time, if everything happens for a reason, you kind of have to think, maybe it's a way to preserve symbology and a way to preserve specific name and interest in this specific deity that wouldn't have been there unless somebody has conflated him with something in a different religion at one point so that it's a bad thing but also could possibly be a good thing yeah i definitely see that as well and then plus you know naturally there's ha Setan, so the the accuser who is also on god's side mm -hmm. so it's just yeah there's is an angel who is just like testing people um but unfortunately through uh through time Things have been warped, uh, for better or for worse. But, yeah, uh, Christian, Christian's mythology is wild because it has been warped so badly that uh, you can just dig and it's a hole that keeps on giving. And you can keep on digging and most people in popular cultures have not even started to dig even the tiniest bit of it yet. And sometimes even go on things that are in the popular culture, but not really in their religion, like the whole circles of hell thing. That is very much Dante's Inferno thing. That is not really Christianity thing. So yeah, it gets very muddied very, very fast. Yeah, the, the adaptation of these fictional rings of hell, that, that, that was very interesting, I have to say. <laughs> um, so thank you for that. Um, my last question is, what is your overall experience working with Lucifer? Oh god. Oh, that would be, um... Uh, okay. Take, take it however <laughs> you wish. I understand it's quite, quite the question. That, that is a long one. It's like asking somebody that has been religious for like the five years, for the past five years, going, so what is your overall experience <laughs> of your personal religion? And you're like, ah, ah, uh, um... Let's see, if I just tried giving it a surface 
kind of overview, I would say that it is a very light and gentle spirit that leans a lot into giving you hope and ways to cope and continue going. It is a very life-affirming spirit and it is funny because I dress very black, I like nighttime, my spirit's kind of actively pushing me into enjoying morning and sunshine and pushing me away from very horrible bar sort of media and into things that are better for my mental health because it is in the end lucifer is light lucifer is bright lucifer is hope lucifer is venus in the morning which is all the associations that come with venus in the morning it's gentle healing it is very much knowing yourself and it's a logical spirit it it's just so many things, but I would say that I am better off for being religious with this spirit than without it. It is a very unique experience and trying to put it into words, it's like trying to sum up five years in a sentence. <laughs> I understand that. No, um, thank you very much for trying to, uh, once again, kind of condense things into something that is, uh, consumable, I suppose. I tried my time. best. Ooh, ooh. And if anyone wants to experience me for some really bizarre reason, I too have a YouTube channel where I tend to do occult shit and gaming shit. And sometimes these two cross over, sometimes it's more gaming, sometimes it's more occult. It's a very long-running funny channel, and I think you're trying to do the same thing but better because you kind of combined both topics into one, which makes it a lot more targetable for the audience, honestly. <laughs> I'm not sure, but uh, I am trying. <laughs> it's not like, well, this lady plays a game one day and then the next day, whiplash, let's talk about occult stuff. <laughs> <laughs> At the very least with yours, you're signing up for like this neat little package where this knowledgeable lady talks about occult stuff in games which is a lot more packageable <laughs> i'm not sure i'd say knowledgeable I'm, I'm still always learning uh quite frankly but, oh yeah. come on you read a lot of books you are knowledgeable ah you know there's always more books to read so <laughs> that's how i see it <laughs> and um, to write apparently <laughs> But you also write as well, uh, so that yeah. also leads up to the the following. Like, would you like to plug any of your things? Because you are an author, you do also have a YouTube channel, as you mentioned, and you do a lot of cool stuff too. I can give you a very big Reddit thread to just link in the description down below because it has all of my books for free, just kind of listed there. But I write under pseudonym Myrta Wake, so if you type that into Amazon, you can probably find them. I wrote uh, Luciferian's View Deity work on ideas for finding and diversifying your practice, which was very much the first thing that I've done as a spiritual person. And by this point, that book is a bit immature, but still gets through the right concepts fairly okay. I have a complete guide on how to sell your soul, which is edgy on purpose. I have Demon Altar's Handbook, where I tried to dig up as much information as possible on a hundred spirits, which are mentioned in the Goetic and Tucante pantheons, because they kind of go side by side. The pantheon is probably not the right word, but it will do. I have an Iceberg of Tarot, if anyone needs help with starting their own tarot reading practice because that comes into my own spirituality quite a bit and i also have worshiping demons 101 that book is a handbook for anyone that is very confused as to how to start demonolatry but kind of want to do it but they just need somebody to like spell the a's and the b's and the c's but all of this if you don't have money or don't want to give me anything is available entirely for free in the form of pdfs in my master thread that I have on Reddit on my user, so that's what's linked in the description. Just click into that and you can peruse to your heart's content. 
That is very wonderful. Thank you very much. And I will be putting this in the description of the video. And I'll probably also pin it as well because some people just don't read the description. So <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Marta, uh, for your time and for answering all these questions, which they were they were a lot. I, I have to agree. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, so make sure to check out Myrta as well. So uh, if you are at all interested in the occult, learning about different demons, you know, the Ducante spirits and whatnot, as mentioned, definitely check out her channel. It will be linked in the description and pinned. Faith Chapter 3 is where most demons pop up, where Ba'el, Astroth, Malthus, and Andras appear very openly. Ba'el is described in Dictionnaire Infernal, Colin de Plancy, 1863 edition as, According to the Le Grand Grimoire, Ba'el is the head of the Infernal Powers. He is also the first demon listed in Wyrus' Pseudomonarche Daemonum. According to Wyrus, Ba'el is the first king of hell with the states in the east. He has three heads, a toad, a man, and a cat. He also speaks in a raucous but well-formed voice and commands 66 legions. Ba'el teaches the art of invisibility and may be equivalent of Ba'al. Ba'el again is a complicated matter. Ba'el is believed to be completely separate from Ba'al by many people. Ba'el can commonly be perceived as the pagan god of fertility, Ba'al, specifically Ba'al Hadad. Some think this is Beelzebub instead, known as Ba'al Zebub. Meanwhile, others have theorized a relation with another pagan god, Bel, due to links with fire festivals, but this doesn't appear to be widely accepted. As Baal itself is a title meaning lord, there have been many kings and otherwise known under this title, so it is hard to pinpoint specifically who this demon is for certain. Plenty of people who work with demons operate in alignment with what is called an unverified personal gnosis, or UPG for short, meaning the specifics that any one person believes in and or goes through may not align with anybody else's spiritual experiences that are similar in nature. There is also the Bible passage of Judges 3.7, New International Version, which states, The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and the Asherahs. Obviously, we have overlap with Astaroth here, and we do have Baal mentioned in the plural form, as well as Asherah, clearly indicating multiples of both. We can logically take from this that male and female forms of these idols could have been additionally recognized at the time, creating a masculine and feminine form of Astaroth. Ashra would have been one name identified with Astaroth due to links with the goddess Astarte. David T. Sugimoto's text, Transformation of a Goddess, goes into detail on the evolution of Astarte. Naturally, moving on to Astaroth, he is described in the Lesser Case of Solomon, McGregor Mathers, 1904, as the 29th spirit. He is a mighty strong duke and appeared in the form of an hurtful angel riding on an infernal beast like a dragon and carrying in his right hand a viper. Thou must in no wise let him approach too near unto thee, lest he do thee damage by his noisome breath. Wherefore the magician must hold the magical ring near his face, and that will defend him. He giveth true answers of things past, present, and to come, and can discover all secrets. He will declare wittingly how the spirits fell, if desired, and the reason of his own fall. He can make men wonderfully knowing in all liberal sciences. He ruleth forty legions of spirits. His seal is this, which thou wear as a layman before thee, or else he will not appear, nor yet obey thee, etc. This demon is thought to have origins as the pagan goddess Astarte of Babylonian belief, a goddess of love, beauty, fertility, war, and more. Andras is listed in the Pseudomonarche Daemonum Johann Weir, 1583, as Andras is a great marquess, and is seen in an angel shape with a head like a black knight raven, riding upon a black and a very strong wolf, flourishing with the sharp sword in his hand. He can kill the master, the servant, and all assistants. He is author of discords and ruleth thirty legions. Andras isn't mentioned anywhere in the Bible. It just seems to translate from ancient Greek into plural form of an adult or a mortal male. Malthus is mentioned in numerous notes in Chapter 3. Malthus is listed in Dictionnaire Infernal by Johann Weir, 1863 edition as Malthus, great president of the underworld who appears in the form of a raven. When he shows himself with the human figure, the sound of his voice is hoarse. He builds impregnable citadels and towers, overturns enemy ramparts, finds good workmen, gives familiar spirits, receives sacrifices, and deceives the sacrificers. Forty legions obey him. No ties between Malthus and the Bible or any specific pagan deities can be identified. 
Some demonologers have claimed that Malthus and Halphus work more than wonderfully together, and may offer possible suspicion to twin deities. Again, not many have made this claim, and it could be a couple isolated cases of demonologers having similar experiences, rather than a truly shared personal gnosis. Or these demons just happen to work quite well together. Time can only tell. We see Malphus very often throughout the series, not just with reference by note, but full-blown possession by this demon. So why these demons? The choice of those included is interesting. Baal gives invisibility and wisdom to those who call upon him. This is useful during periods of war, for example, when you want to remain out of sight of the enemy. This could help a cult or other organization flourish. Malthus helps arm and give ammunition to people. It's clear that this helps suit the cult in their upcoming attack, which we see in Chapter 3's endings 2 and 3. Andrus can sow discord. This we can see as planting confusion, instilling doubt. And even through the neighbors' TVs on the same ending 3, we can see the result of such confusion and warlike aspect. Astroth offers insight into the liberal sciences. They can teach people, make them better with current skills and learning new ones. Liberal sciences includes political and social sciences, literature, music, history, and philosophy. Through those powers, Astroth can help magicians gain favors with those in power, influence others through the arts, and bring those people on board to increase cult members. This latter being applied to other demons too. These are all important for getting into high and useful positions. Person is described in the Lesser Keys of Solomon, McGregor Mother's 1984 version as The 20th spirit is Person, a great king. His appearance is comely, like a man with a lion's face, carrying a cruel viper in his hand and riding upon a bear. Going before him are many trumpets sounding. He knoweth all things hidden and can discover treasure, and tell all things past, present, and to come. He can take a body either human or aerial, and answereth truly of all earthly things both secret and divine, and of the creation of the world. He bringeth forth good familiars, under his government there be twenty-two legions of spirits, partly of the order of virtues, and partly of the order of thrones. His mark, seal, or character is this, unto the which he oweth obedience, and which thou shalt wear in time of action, etc. I was quite interested in the theistic aspect of working with these demons. Myrta went and contacted each demon of the Arsgotia for one of her books, which resulted in short-form content about these experiences. Referencing these, she had a lot to say about the demons. I saw a black round eyeball and then a crow. I asked the spirit to move in closer so that I can sense them, but he refused. Malthus likes their distance, though he did agree to a conversation. They'll work with anyone, no matter the person came to ask for something to do with their area of expertise or not. However, they're not suited to working with extroverts, people that require physical closeness, or those that would like to be coddled. He does not radiate warmth. He is especially well suited to working with those that get overwhelmed by people or physical sensations, as he will respect your boundaries and will stay at a distance. Baal felt hot and like it was hovering above. We were not on the same level. After I explained my reasons for being there, I was granted an audience and it felt like the spirit was granting me a favor by doing so. I asked what people currently approach Baal for and what reasons, and I was told that farmers are a good fit, but so are those struggling to conceive or business and wishing for prosperity as he can make your business more fertile. The entity did warn that my approach was wrong, but that he will make an exception this time and passed on a message that he expects to be talked in a way that signifies his statue. Like, O oh Lord, O oh King, please hear my plea or please grant me an audience. And not as casually as I typically do. It seems that you can be forgiven for approaching Baal wrong, but you are risking being left unanswered by not being formal enough. Astaroth came to me as a female presenting spirit. I have checked both the sigil and the end for Astarte and the one for Astaroth, and both lead me to the same one spirit. Her presence feels heavy to me, slightly dizzying, slightly warm, but highly neutral, as there are no strong sensations outside of the heaviness. From my own personal interactions, the spirit has told me that she has a male form, but is more likely to present female, and that she accepts working with people of all walks of life, 
but has a particular liking to women. Andres came with a sense of pressure to the point of pain on my collarbone and my lower arms, that area between wrist and elbow. The spirit asked me to precisely state why I have called upon them. Upon doing so, they have agreed to have a talk with me. They have remarked that while they may not be considered to have a very high status, they're like a needle and they're able to concentrate their energy and pierce, which is why they feel as pressurizing as they do. They have offered to take care of some of my problems in my life. I politely refused and state how this action would go contrary to my patron's wishes. This was understood and taken well. I have found them to be very polite and straightforward to work with, however I suggest that one gains experience with other spirits before approaching this one, and that they approach this spirit in a very straightforward way, knowing their exact wish as this spirit will not appreciate having their time wasted. As I was very clever in forgetting to ask Myrta about King Person, I decided to gain information in another way. Person appeared in a ring of daisies beneath a clear and open sky with leonine features and informal attire. His energy felt like warm soil, and off the earth slightly cold dampness beneath the surface during summer all at once. But their energy was quite gentle. He was both kind and welcoming, and his presence gave a soothing effect. Person gladly accepted my question on who he would best work with, and I received the answer of those who want to expand their social circles, any person who wants to increase their knowledge, and who wishes to learn more about the universe and its stories. There is nobody who King Person is not willing to talk to. I understand that this will be a remarkable departure from a lot of the content that I would usually make, uh, but for anybody who has stuck around for this long, uh, thank you. If you want to like and or subscribe, it is entirely up to you. Um, it does help me, it helps the channel, but do as you please. I think that's the best way of going about it. Thank you again for watching and until next time, bye.